And around the world in every tongue To every nation, tribe, and clan The gospel must be preached to every man So who will go and light the way That leads lost souls to Christ? Who will go and light Tonight I want to start by putting some extra kindling on the fire. And as we look at and read the Bible, the Bible itself, the words that, are, that God has put there are not just, it's not just another book. It's not just other words. Because these words that Christ has put in the Bible, uh, they're special. And they're special in the fact that in the words is the very life of God. Amen. So God has not only spoken words, but he's put his power and his life in those words. So it is truly the living word. And as we digest, as we eat some of this word tonight and throughout the weekend, it will start to form. It will start to do a work that we don't, uh, we don't have control of. Now, we can choose to go with the power, and we can, uh, we can choose to go against the power. But that word itself has the power in it to do what it says it will do. And if we believe that, and if we allow that word to do what it says it will do, that's faith. Amen. And a lot of people say, well, you're doing a missions camp. Why don't you call it missions camp? Why do you call it faith camp? Because we don't want to get the idea that we can do missions by ourselves. <laughs> that you have to, if you're really going to go into, into missions at any, with any degree of, of hope, that you're going to accomplish anything good, you've got to have faith. Amen. And also, on the other hand, you can't have a lot of faith without being involved with missions. They go hand in hand. And I believe that God has given us missions as a gift for us to develop faith. And is faith important in the Christian walk? absolutely vital. Without faith, you can't have anything. You can't please God without faith. And I think that's kind of an important thing, to please God. And everything we receive from Christ, we receive by faith. Everything, salvation, hope, eternal life, all these kinds of things. So God has given us what I call the gymnasium for our faith. He's given us a work to do something to, to be a part of. Now, Christ, God, the Father, had one son. He was a missionary. He sent him as a missionary. The Spirit of Christ is a missionary spirit. So the more we imbibe of the missionary spirit, the more we are imbibing of, the, of Jesus' spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And I hear, and the more we pray for the outpouring of the latter rain, of the Holy Spirit in latter rain power, the more we are praying and requesting the spirit that calls us to give up everything that we have, all of our comforts, tear away from those things that we may hold as dear, and abandon all those things for the sake of taking the gospel to the world. That's the spirit we're praying for. And so if we're praying for that spirit with knowing that this is what God is calling us to do, and knowing that that's the spirit we're praying for, God will answer, and he will give us that spirit, because it's his spirit. And it's him, himself. You may be wondering, why gateway to joy? Where did this term come from? It's actually a term that came out of my own experience. Uh, this was, I think, in 2008. And I'll be sharing that experience with you. But the first thing I want to do is I want to look at what is, what, what is the characteristic of a Christian life? What does that look like? What does it look like to be a Christian? And there's a lot of definitions um, and styles floating around of what a Christian is supposed to look like or what a, being a Christian is. But what is it that, that a Christian is called to do or called to be? And I think that one prime example that we can look at in general is how God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. Okay. He came in and did amazing miracles, and then he called them out. And by the time they got done seeing all the miracles that God did, they were willing to follow him out into the Negev Desert. I don't know if anybody's been in the Negev Desert, but
But I've been in the Negev Desert, and it's not a place you want to take anybody. It's not a place you want to go yourself. Nothing grows there. It's a wasteland. No moisture, lots of sand, lots of rock, a lot of salt. Just not a hospitable place. And they were willing to, to follow God. They didn't know they were going to be in the desert for 40 years. They thought they were just making a beeline right to, to the land of Canaan. But God took them the wrong way, <laughs> according to their eyes. I mean, he took them down this long, narrow gorge through the mountains, took probably a day or two, two days to get through this long, narrow gorge where sometimes they had to walk two or three abreast. They couldn't spread out because it was so narrow and the mountains were really tall. And he took them out to a place where the sand that had come down through as a, as a river during uh, floods in that area had, had made a little, bit of a little bit of a beach there. And they all camped there at, at the edge of the sea. And as they looked around, they saw mountains there, mountains there, ocean there, little tiny path going back up to freedom. And this was out in the middle of nowhere. And word got back to Pharaoh. And in those days, they didn't have text messaging <laughs> or even email. So somehow, somebody ran back to Egypt, which was quite a ways, told him that they were tangled in the wilderness. Pharaoh got all of his troops together, which took a little while. And then they had to go all the way out to there. So I'm guessing that they were camped out on this beach for at least a week, maybe even two weeks long enough to figure out that they were in a very impossible situation. But God brought them there on purpose, on purpose. And they didn't know what was going to happen. As they saw the Egyptian army coming, they thought, we're going to die, because they had never, ever read the Bible. It's not that they were poor Christians. They didn't have a Bible. You know, Moses had probably written one, one, one book, maybe two books, but they didn't have the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. <laughs> Never been done before. So they're sitting there in a completely impossible situation thinking, we're going to die. And the truth is, in all human planning, they were going to die or be taken back. And a lot of them died and taken back to slavery. But God did something amazing. As you know, he split the Red Sea and they walked across. Now, before he split the Red Sea, they started crying and complaining and freaking out. Now, those of you that have raised children, I think, would know that the best thing to do is have things prepared ahead of time so that when the child gets there, they don't start complaining. Now, I think if God was smart, he would have had the Red Sea already split open. So by the time they got there, they wouldn't have to freak out. They'd say, oh, okay, all right, no problem. And God'd say, well, just wait until the Egyptians get there. And then, you know, they wouldn't have to listen. Well, why did God do that? And then they, he took them to the bitter waters, okay? And they were thirsty, and they started to drink, and it was bitter, and they started complaining again. Now, why didn't God clear up the waters before they started drinking or tasted it, before they got there? And then God took them to the bottom of the mountain and he left them alone for 40 days. You don't leave kids alone for a long time, okay? They're going to get into trouble. So why did God do all that? Why did he lead them that way? Now, this is incredibly important for us to understand because that is the way God leads all of us. He does it for a purpose. He brings us into certain situations that we see as trying, call them trying situations, tribulation, tribulate, you know, a difficult situation. Why? It says, he proved thee to know what was in your heart. Okay, now did God already knew, know what was in their heart? Absolutely. He knew that when he took them to the edge of the Red Sea and the Egyptians started coming, they were going to freak out. He knew that they were going to start complaining at the bitter water. He knew all this stuff. So why did, why why did he do that? For them to know what was in their own heart. For them to know what was in their own heart. Because in Malachi 3, he says, I sit as a refiner, as a refiner of fine metals, with gold and silver. And how do you refine silver and gold? Well, you take a rock, 
It's got a little bit of gold in it. It's mostly junk. And you heat it up, put it in a fire, and, and then it, you take off the, the junk, and then you heat it in the fire more. And then you keep on heating, keep on doing that process until all the junk has risen to the surface so that the refiner can then take that junk away. Now, me as a human, when I see the junk rising up in me, you know, my anger, my bad temper, my, uh, you know, my, my, my uh, jealousy, all these, you know, my, my feelings of, of inferiority, whatever they are, when I see them start to rise up, my initial reaction is to push those down, to, to stuff it, okay, to stuff those things. Because, man, if those things came out, oh, God's not going to like me anymore. My dad sure doesn't like me. Well, he likes me, but, you know, he, I, he lets me know. And my friends kind of, like, go away. So that's what's going to happen with God. If all the stuff starts coming out, it, he's going to go away. But that's not why God brings those things out. So you see, as the children of Israel came and they, they started freaking out, they didn't know that in that situation, they were going to freak out. And when they came to the bitter waters, they didn't know, the people didn't know that they were going to complain and murmur. And so God brought them to that situation so that this junk would come to the surface and they could see, oh, I don't have faith. Oh, I don't trust God. Oh, I complain and I murmur. (laughs) Can you imagine finding that out and then telling God and then thinking that he's going to be surprised? But this is something that is really, 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 really important to God. Really important. It says that your faith, even though it be tried like fire, is more precious than gold, though it be tried like fire. Why? Because it's your faith. It's your faith that will take you through, that will will connect you with God for eternity, forever. And so it's that faith. God is, you know, we want to get it... those of you that are involved with missions, we want to get a job done. God wants to develop a character. And this is what he's trying to do. And, but we take ourselves out of his hands. See, the children of Israel, they learned some character, but they didn't learn that much about God while they were in Egypt, in pagan Egypt. Okay? But God took them out of Egypt and took them into the wilderness in a, in a situation where they had no food, They had no health care. They had no insurance. They had no way out. In the middle of the Negev Desert, there's not too many ways out of there. That's a long ways, and you'll die before you get out. So he took them into a situation where they were completely dependent on God for everything, for life. And that's where they learned faith. But we replace dependence on God with insurance, retirement plans, All these things, a plan for our life, a good education, a good job, and a comfortable life so that we don't have to experience the very things that would draw us closer to Christ and strengthen our faith. And so God brings us through difficulties. In fact, Mrs. White makes a statement where she says, when following God, though the path leads through a desert or an ocean, it is a safe path. Even if we die, it is a safe path. That's the complete package. There's somebody that's inspiring me lately. His name is Pastor John Piper. He's, I think, a Baptist pastor up in in Minnesota. And um, this is kind of like the headline for me, when I, I, I was listening to his sermon this morning, and this, this just is amazing. This, is, this to me summarizes my experience in Christ, at least one aspect of it. He says, this is John Piper, and I quote, I am not coming with a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, or on a health, wealth, and prosperity mission. I am not bringing the message. Now, this is a this is a man, this is a pastor that his main theme or his main motto is, uh, he calls himself a Christian hedonist. So he's seeking pleasure in Christ. Okay? 
He's actively, wholeheartedly seeking his highest pleasure in Christ. He's got books about this. It's amazing. But he said, so you'd think, okay, Christian hedonist. Hedonist means pleasure seeker. You think, okay, he's, you know, he goes out and parties and still calls himself a Christian. But this is what he's saying. I am not coming with a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Or I'm not on a health, wealth, and prosperity mission. I am not bringing the message that Christ will make you healthy. Christ will make you wealthy. Christ will make you prosperous in this life so that you can have joy. He says, that's not my message. He says, I am bringing you a message that Christ will give you himself so that you don't need health, wealth, and prosperity in order to be happy. But you can have so much invincible joy in the durable Christ you can, that you can give up health, wealth, and prosperity in the sacrifices of love if Christ calls you. And he's, he goes on to say, he says, if you catch on to what I'm saying, or if any of you parents brought your kids, that's risky. He says, I get in trouble with a lot of parents because of what kids do when they listen to messages like this. They do crazy things for Jesus. After they learn that their joy can be rooted in something absolutely higher, more sure, more satisfying than the American dream. Okay, which dad had for them. And now dad's really mad at me because they're off in Afghanistan. <laughs> so... So this is, this is what we're going to be looking at, and this is what I want to talk about this week. To enter into the title of, that, of the theme of this faith camp, I want to tell you a little, bit of, little story. This happened in, I think, 2008. We were going to, on a trip, we, there was two families that wanted to go see the mission field. And so we were going there, we spent some time in Thailand, and then we went to India. And I, in preparation for this trip, had set aside a certain amount of funds so that we had enough to get my family. My daughter was, I think, five or six. My son was seven or eight. So they were young, and they're my family. I care about them. I want to see them happy and healthy and eventually home in one piece. And so we started our trip with a certain amount of funds in the bank account so that we could complete the trip. We were going to be gone, I think, three months. And we did our Thailand thing, then we went to India. We often go to Thailand before we go to India because it's kind of a step, step into that society. And then we first get to Thailand, most, most uh, I don't want to say newbies, uh, but newcomers. Uh, are shocked at how you know poor it seems and so dirty and unkept and so many cars flying all over the place and then they go to India and they come back to Thailand and they're amazed how wealthy and how quiet and how clean the streets are. It's just incredible. So we went to Thailand and then we went to India and while we were in India we got word from our director there we have um, a number of evening schools that Dalits and lower caste children can come and they can learn to read and write. They learn to sing Bible songs, they learn scripture songs, and they also get a second meal for the day. Most of them only get one meal a day, so we provide them a second meal. We learned that they had run out of money. They didn't have enough funds, and so the kids were going to go hungry. And so I thought, you know, we have some funds. I mean, we haven't, we're only about halfway through our trip, so we have some funds in the bank for our trip that we could give them. But then that would mean that I didn't have enough money to finish the trip with my family. But God can provide, right? Amen. Yeah, I mean, that's easy to say <laughs> here. But when you're there and you're in the situation, I was astounded at how hard that decision was. In my mind, I thought, yeah, we'll just do it and we'll step out by faith. But getting those words out, oh man, that was hard. You know, and I thought that the, 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 the act of faith would, you know, up until then, 
It had always been a joyful act of giving. But at that point, I was giving beyond my ability to take care of myself and my family. And it was, oh man, I struggled with that. For, it was, took me about an hour and a half to finally say, yes, take some of this money, feed the children, we're going to trust God. And other people may have more faith. I know many other people have much more faith than I do, but that was my experience. And it's, it was, and then the next, and, and it didn't get easier after I said that. It wasn't like, whew, that's good. No, it's like, oh my goodness, that means I don't have enough money to get my family home. And what if God doesn't provide? And okay, well, I believe that he's going to provide, but right now I don't have that money to get home. And then we went back to Thailand and the money wasn't coming. It wasn't coming. And so we were day by day giving money to eat and to survive, but there was no money coming in. And it was like getting so hard for me. It was just like this massive weight was on my head, just pressing me down, unable to, I mean, I had a hard time smiling. I was irritable. It's just like, Lord, what are you doing? And I'll never forget being in, in uh, downtown Bangkok uh, with my family there in the hotel room, and the hotel room was costing us a huge amount of money. I think it was $12 a night. It's just insane. And then probably another, I mean, between the four of us, we were spending probably $20 a day on food. I mean, yeah, something like that. And I was thinking, Lord, we're spending all this money, and I just, we don't have any money. And, and of course, we came to the time when there was no more money left. And I remember standing on the side of the street thinking, this is crazy. And a, st tape, a tape started playing in my head. You fool. How could you allow yourself to get into a situation that you can't get yourself out of? And I realized, all my life, I'd been going to school, I'd been getting a job, I'd been doing all this huge amount of planning to make sure I never got into a situation that I couldn't get myself out of. And I look back and I remember the attitudes of my dear parents. Somebody got in a tough, tough situation and they say, well, you know, he could have planned ahead a little better. And that's true, but in my mind, it got turned into that fool. He's not very smart. He should have planned better. And I remember in my mind thinking, I will never allow myself to get into a situation like that. You just have to plan enough ahead to steer out of that situation. Here I was in a situation where, you know, the mountains on this side was our creditors. <laughs> and the mountains on this side was a lack of money. And the, and the ocean, I mean, it was like, I realized I, there is nothing I can do to get out of this situation that I'm in. We're going to, I don't know, we're going to die. We're going to, we're getting into, I mean, this is going to be really bad. And I don't know what to do. I might have to call my mom. You know, 45-year-old man. And uh, for me, and I think the Lord allowed me to kind of, I think he put this burden and kind of opens this up so that we see our situations. Again, it's for a purpose. And, and I remember on the, on the kitchen door of Danny Shelton's house in Thompsonville, Illinois, is a, is a bumper sticker. I don't know why he put it there. But anyway, he's got this bumper sticker that says, faith is not faith until everything is hanging on it. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Until then, I was in Bangkok, and I had nothing but faith. And it's like, whoa, that's not cool. That hurts. For me, that hurt. That was painful. And so I'm like, for the first time in my life, the first time, 30, 45 years old, Christian from birth, missionary son, everything, gone up through the system, everything. The first time in my life I was ever in a situation where I couldn't get myself out of it. 
the only thing I could do was trust God. And you that have been through it, you're smiling and nodding. It's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But for me, that was, that was really, really, really painful. Knowing that I, I, I mean, it's like taking that, give me that control back. Give me some money so I can like buy my way out of this situation. But then it got worse. <laughs> the next day, no money came, but more bills came. And then the day after that, but I thought about it. I, I, I meditated on the word. I said, okay, I'm, I've learned to go to the Bible because the Bible is God's word and the Bible is truth. It cannot lie. It cannot let me down. So I went to the Bible and it said, my God shall supply all your need. Call on me in the day of trouble and I will answer and you will glorify me. So I said, praise God. I take that. You're going to supply all my needs. Praise God. Praise God. A couple days later, no money, bigger bills. Lord, you're killing me. And I thought, you know, if I just exercised faith and if I just claimed this word for myself, then God would do a miracle and split the Red Sea open like he did for the children of Israel and we go sailing through and everything would be fine. And a few days later, it was worse. And so I finally got to the point where I exercised a lot of faith. I said, Lord, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I'm like, man, that is, that is so much faith. But I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. I'm willing. Can you send the money now, now that I'm willing? <laughs> no money. No money. And it got worse and worse and worse. And finally, I, I called my good friend, David Gates. And I didn't like his prayer. So I told him I was at the Red Sea I needed everything to part. Things were getting worse. It was just, we're going to drown. We're going to die. You know what he prayed for? He prayed for scuba gear. So that if we went under, we could still breathe. <laughs> it's a beautiful prayer, but I didn't like it. And, um, and it went on and on. Lord, this burden, I don't think I can handle it anymore. And then somehow, in my readings, I came across a little statement, a little paragraph by George Mueller. Uh, George Mueller is, uh, is a man who lived in the 1800s. He, by faith, um, raised, I think they say in today's money, over $180 million went through his hands towards taking care of orphans in Bristol, England, back in the 1800s. Big need. Um, and he said this one statement. He says, God delights to grow our faith. But the only way your faith can grow, our faith can grow, is through trial, difficulties, and delay. He says that trials, difficulty, and, the, and delay are the very food of faith. If we received everything as soon as we asked for it, our faith would not grow. But it's in those difficulties. So he says we should, accept, we should accept these persecutions and these difficulties and these trials and these delays as from the hand of a loving father who desires for us to grow. And that hit home. That just changed everything. It's like the light switch went on. And my whole attitude changed from, Lord, though you slay me, <laughs> I will trust you, to... My God loves me, and all the wonder I see. The sunbeam shines through my window. My God loves me. Seeing those difficulties and those trials as from the hand of a loving, because he loves me. It's not because he hates me and he's trying to grind me down to see if I'll leave him, see if I'll go somewhere else, go back home. He was, as a loving father, giving me an opportunity to learn, to grow. And I realized that that suffering was my gateway to joy. And coming out of that experience, it's like, man, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. So I learned so much. First time in my life I'd ever been, been completely dependent upon God. And you know what? Here we are, six years later, it's still tough. He hasn't split the Red Sea. We're wearing scuba gear. 
And God is still doing it. Amen. God is still doing it. And this is what missions is all about. Amen. As we venture out to go beyond what we're capable of. There's a young lady. She was, uh, I think, 22 or 25 by now. As an 18 or 19-year-old, she went over to Africa her na- and, and fell in love with the children there. And now, at the age of 24, 25, she's got 16 daughters that she takes care of as a family. And she says, people say, God never gives us more than we can handle. And she says, that sounds really good, if it were true. <laughs> she says, it is, it is totally untrue, because God gives us more than we can handle for purpose, for a reason. How old is she? 24? She has 14. Sorry, not 16. Yeah, we love that book. My family read, you you should get it. Kisses from Katie. She was voted uh, Woman of the Year by, was it Vogue magazine? Anyway, uh, amazing story. Really, really looks into the heart of what it is to serve Christ. And so as as we enter into his service and as we put ourselves in his hands, then he, began, he can begin to use our circumstances as a way to work on our character and to bring us, this is the main key, to bring us closer to him. This is what he does. This is how he does it. To bring us closer to him because we can't see him. We enter this relationship by faith and by experience. And the experience is as we see him working in in our lives. And we can only see him working in our lives. I mean, it's one thing. I grew up all my life believing that it was a powerful God that created the whole world 6,000 years ago. And as a powerful God that 2,000 years ago came down and healed all these people. And as a powerful God that in, you know, in the future, very near future, he's going to come in the, in the clouds of glory and take us home. I can believe in that God, but a God that will do that miracle for me, for me, In this situation, I know he can do it, but does he even want to? And I think that that is a key, that is a key question in the majority of our minds. Yeah, God is powerful. We all believe that. But will he exercise that power for me? Because when I was a six-year-old, I was out riding my bike, and it was a Friday evening, and before sundown, and I had to get home, but I hopped off the bike and took the little cap off the, the inner tube, and I put it down, and I checked the tire pressure, and everything was good, and then I couldn't find the cap. And I remember reading in our Bible friends' books that people just pray, and whoa, there it is. So I prayed, and there it wasn't. <laughs> I couldn't find the cap. And so the, for the next 30 years, I had this in the back of my mind, God never gave me that cap. I don't know if I can trust him. I don't know if I can trust him in my situation. And it wasn't until a long time later so I started to understand more of this faith. And I think there's a lot, of, a lot of misunderstanding about what faith is and how to exercise it. Faith versus feeling and all these things. And we don't really, it's like, I can tell you how to ride a bicycle. I can tell you how to ride a, a motorcycle. But until you actually get on and start riding, you won't know how to ride a bicycle or a motorcycle. And it's the same way with walking by faith. We cannot learn it by reading books. We can learn a lot about it, and we can learn insights into it, but it's something that we have to practice ourselves and find out, does God love me? Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things, food and clothing, will be added unto you. Well, that sounds great, but I never knew anybody that actually did that. You know, when I was growing up, that kind of prayer, God taking care of you, was when you lost your job and you were really anxiously looking for another job. He would help you find that job so then he could relax. (laughs) Didn't have to help provide for you. But I believe that God loves to provide for us. It's like I love to provide for my kids. I want to give them the best. And I think God's the same way. And what is the best thing God can give us? What is the absolute best thing 
God could give us besides himself. Himself. There is a story of, of a, um, a preacher in China that went and visited a couple because they had invited him to come. And they said, Pastor, can you pray for us? We're going through lots of trouble. Well, what's the problem? Well, we always seem to be irritable and short-tempered with each other. Can you pray for patience for us? And the pastor thought about it and thought, he says, nope, can't do that. What? And they got irritated and lost their temper at him. He says, how can you not, have we gone too far? Um, you, you can't pray this prayer for us? And he says, no, that's not the way it works. Christ doesn't take a little bit of this, oh, looks like you need a little more patience. Here's some patience. Oh, looks like you need a little bit more integrity. Here's some integrity. No, that's not the way it works at all. He says, the way it works is he gives you himself. And then he has the integrity. He has the patience. He has all the things that you need to live a godly life. So he is the great treasure. And he talks about, Jesus talked about this treasure that a man found hid in a field. He found this treasure in the field. And this treasure was worth more than anything else he ever owned. It was worth more than his house, worth more than his cart, <laughs> worth more than everything that he owned. And with joy, he sold everything. And we often miss the joy part. We think, oh, I've got to do this because I believe in God. Or I've got, to, I've got to buckle down and obey because, because I, want to, I want to follow God. I want to be a good person. And it seems like a tedious and tiresome task to be a Christian and to follow Christ. But that's the opposite, the opposite of the reality. With joy, because he knew he was going to get a treasure. He could buy all kinds of houses and stuff after that. So yeah, get rid of this old clunky car. I'm going to get a treasure that's going to give me worlds of cars or whatever you, or even better than cars. <laughs> you know, I love cars. I grew up loving cars. I was obsessed with cars. Ferrari, that was my dream car. I always wanted to have a Ferrari. But when I get to heaven, I could buy a million Ferraris. Seriously. I mean, really. You guys don't know there's no Ferraris in heaven, do you? I mean, yeah, it's probably not going to be there, but you've never been there, so you can't say there isn't going to be one there. Or if there's no Ferrari, I bet you God was going to have something even better, okay, than the Ferrari. <laughs> so I give up the Ferrari, gladly. <laughs> They're a waste of time, waste of money, waste of anxiety. Can you imagine driving a $100,000 car down the road and hoping nobody bumps it? Or park going to the shopping center and hoping nobody scratches the side. I mean, forget it. I don't need that stress. And the insurance and somebody coming, hey, can I ride in your car? No. <laughs> you know, it's just all that stuff. And, and what we're being given is so much better. Amen. So much better. When I finally got away from my parents... <laughs> and started doing my own thing, everything that I wanted to do, I couldn't believe how bored I was. Just flat bored. I mean, I was doing fun stuff, and I was getting, it was exciting, but I was so bored inside. And when I found myself in God's will, even though I was in Cambodia, and I heard my first AK-47 go off behind me, and then there was checkpoints every, every hour or so, with guards with guns, and you had to pay them to let you through. And there was a bridge with a, with a trip wire and a, and a machine gun sitting on the side. So if you go over the trip wires, you know, even though I was there, I knew I was in God's will. And I realized I'd rather die in God's will than live in my will. And that's what God has given us. That's what God is giving us, that treasure that if you have me, you have eternal life. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which are his words. If you eat my words and drink my words, if you have the Christ, you have life eternal. But that life, that life is special. That life 
He understands some things that we as humans in our carnal nature do not yet understand. He understands where the true joy really is. It's in receiving Christ, yes, but more than just receiving Christ, it's in entering into Christ. And it's in Christ entering into you, not just in, in a scent, but in your whole life, the decisions you make and where you go and what you do and why you do those things. There's a statement in Desire of Ages, page 641. It says that when we, have the, when we love the world as Christ loved the world, then we have heaven in our hearts. And I kind of paraphrased that a little bit for those that have that passage memorized. This should be like the, 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 the capstone, the, the, the most memorized te- uh, passage in the whole Ellen White books. So when, we have, when we love the world, and I'll get this right, when we love the world as Christ loved the world, then his mission to us will be complete. So that means that everything that Christ is bringing into my life and everything that Christ is bringing me through in my life and everybody that Christ is having me meet and every disappointment and every success that Christ is giving me is for the purpose of developing in me a love for the world that will take me to the cross. That will bring me to a place where I would be willing, gladly, to sacrifice my life for people that are going to reject me and don't even know me and that I don't even know. That's, when I get to that point, then Christ's mission for me will be complete. That's what he's trying to build into you and I, the ability to care like he cared. And we think, wow, that sounds really hard. I don't know if I could do that. To give all that stuff up and endure all that kind of pain? Well, maybe if I try really hard. But we don't understand. Oh, we don't understand. I can't believe we don't understand. That's not. It's not a grievous thing. Because Christ understands something that we have been missing. Christ understands something about life and joy that we have been missing. And we'll find it right here in Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Okay? For the what that was set before him? The joy. So he looked at the pain and the suffering and and the outpouring of love to the world and all the pain and suffering that that would bring him and he saw through that the joy and that the joy was much better than the pain and the suffering. It was a good investment. And so Jesus saw the cross as a gateway to his own joy. And Christ wants that joy for you and I. And the way to get that kind of joy is to do what Christ did. Is to love others and sacrifice your life and yourself for them. Because in them, in through that, the joy gets amplified, multiplied, grows. And Christ knew that. Christ knows that. And he's trying to get us to see that. (laughs) And we miss it. We miss it. We miss it. We look at it. We see all the the people dying every day. And we say, oh, those poor people. Glad I'm not there. I'm glad I'm here. So thankful for what we have. Oh, and God is saying, you're missing it. You are missing the real joy. You're missing the real joy. It's like we're so happy with our little matchbox cars playing in the sandbox. And Christ wants to take us to the ocean. (laughs) This is what Christ did. Another statement that Mrs. White says, she says that when Christ was hanging on the cross, 
the love that he felt was immeasurable. And I often think, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. I thought he, experienced, he was feeling pain on the cross. I thought he was experiencing his life being crushed out of him. But she says, the love that he felt was immeasurable. It's like, wow. Wow. I want that. I don't have that kind of love. I want it. <laughs> and I think if we all got a taste of that, if everyone got a taste of that kind of love, we would all want it. Many people say that our kids are leaving our churches because they're going after pleasure, going out of, after joy. And I had that in my mind as well, thinking that all those people out there that are going around and doing whatever they want to do, sleeping with whoever they want to sleep and having a good time, they're the ones having fun. And I'm stuck here, not allowed to have any kind of fun. But what C.S. Lewis brings out is that, yeah, we're leaving our kids and we are leaving God so that we can have joy because we just want to be happy. And what he says, and which I believe is absolutely true, is that we don't want to be happy hard enough. We're not trying hard enough to be truly happy. In other words, we're settling. We're settling for the kind of happiness that the world gives us. And that the true happiness and the true joy is in Christ. <laughs> It's treasuring him and valuing him and pursuing him with everything that we have. And not just pursuing him, but the joy in Christ. That is the true joy. That's where the joy is. And so when we go out to the world because we want to be happier and we want to be, have a good time, we're settling. We're giving up and we're just taking, you know, a little bit of joy for a season, for a short time. But... The true joy is actually found in Christ, in sacrifice and in love and in Christ. And to try to go after that joy is really what we should be trying for. That's really what we should be trying for. And the truth is, there was a time I was in India, and it had been a tough time raising funds to send our Bible workers out. We have about 200 Bible workers in India, and I remember... I was at a baptism, it was on a Sabbath afternoon, and I was looking at the people that were going to get baptized. And I'm like, you know what? With all the struggle that we go through to make sure that they get the gospel so that they can be baptized, they're not that pretty people. They're, not, they're kind of ugly. You know, they're old, wrinkled, really poor saris and clothes. They're just not that attractive. And I'm like, Lord, wow, that's just you know, where's this reward you talk about? And then he tapped me on the shoulder and says, think about them a million years from now in heaven. <laughs> they'll be wearing a robe of white. They'll, be ha they'll have a, a golden crown on their heads. Maybe one of them will be the choir director. And millions upon millions of all the heavenly hosts and the redeemed people from all the worlds will gather together. And that person that you think may not be worth that much, maybe she would stand up, raise her hand, and begin the angelic choir. Wow. Can you imagine thinking back to when you thought, well, she's not that attractive? And the joy that that person that person will bring me in heaven. A thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, a billion years from now. What a cheap investment. What a little tiny investment. And that joy will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow throughout eternity. There's another statement that I want to leave you with. A lot of times we get misunderstand who God is. But there's a statement where she says, the, 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 the closer through knowledge and revelation of God, 
the closer we draw to him throughout eternity, the more intense will become our happiness. That just, I mean, that means God is a happy God. And he's so happy that our happiness will continue to grow throughout eternity. We don't know nothing about happiness. But the investment is worth it all. Even a little taste of it here on this earth is way better than anything else that's out there. But there is the gateway. There is the gateway. Seek, you know, endeavor, strive to enter into that gateway. It's not striving to get good works so that he'll accept you. It's strive to enter into Christ. I am the gate. Strive to seek after that joy. Seek, ye shall find me when you seek for me with all your heart. Put your whole heart into this. And don't... I'm, I'm like I'm preaching to you, but this is for me too. Even Paul, who had a lot of stuff, I mean, he was, as a Pharisee, he was probably quite wealthy. He says, I count that all as rubbish compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Just knowing him made everything else worth, worthless. And all the trials and troubles that he went through, the killings and the beatings and the stonings and all those kinds of things, he says, they're light afflictions compared to the treasure that we have in Christ. And I think he began to see. And this is what God is calling us to. And this is why God has given us missions. There's a world out there that has no idea they have a God that loves them. There's a world out there that has even a more twisted view of God than I had. And there's a lot of people out there that would love to know. And so God has spread a feast. This is the title of another sermon. A feast of souls for you to engage, to imbibe, to, to, to fill and to grow your spiritual life on. And we'll get into that more later. But I want to close out tonight with a prayer. And this prayer is a prayer is that God will open our eyes, that we'll be able to see the true value, the way he sees it. And that's a miracle because, as you know, the spirit that's going through the land is a spirit of blindness where we see all the glitter and the gold in this world and we think, wow, that's, that's all there is. That's the best there is. And we miss what's truly, truly a value. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just come to you tonight and we just surrender our hearts to you, Father. There's so much that we can, that we don't see. There's so much there that we just, we have no capability of seeing, Father. We're human. We have human eyes. We have physical eyes. But by faith, Father, we get a hint of who you are and what you have. And if you, Father, the most aged person, the most wide person, wise person, the most knowledgeable person. You know everything, Father. If you know that this is the gateway to joy, Father, that's where we want to go. That's where we want to go. Father, we ask for revival. Send your spirit to tear away the idols that have gripped our hearts and kept us from the joy that you would love to see us have. These things we pray. Not in jest, Father, we're asking. In Jesus' name, amen.